Um, again, if you guys could start sharing this particular broadcast, dear God, we thank you so much for uh, what you're going to do tonight. We thank you for another day that you have given us, God, and extended your grace to us, God. We ask that you be with us and that you send your word, God, not my words, God, but let your words be uh, be here and be present and spoken, God, so that somebody can get exactly what they need for the situation that they are dealing with, God. There is somebody that has given up on their destiny or given up on their purpose because they are looking at at the mistakes that they have made, God, but allow me to say something tonight that will help them to be able to know that their mistakes can become their miracles if they would uh, just give them to you, God. And so we thank you so much for all that you are going to do. In Jesus name, we pray through faith, believing it as done. Amen. And so we are talking about King David. And so I want to start with the scripture again, if you have your Bible or if you have something to write with. Uh, then you guys can go to 2 Samuel chapter 11, verse 26 through 27. And I'm not going to read all of the text. Um, I will give you the text so that you in your own personal time can go through and read it. Of course, for the sake of time, uh, I'm going to just kind of paraphrase a lot of different things so you guys can, can uh, get the gist of what we're talking about today. But it says, when Uriah's wife heard that her husband was dead, she mourned for him. When the period of mourning was over, David sent for her and brought her to the palace and she became one of his wives then she gave birth to a son but the Lord was displeased with what David had done and so again in this scripture we see King David I know we know there's lots of different uh stories about David when he was a little shepherd boy all of that but right now he is the king of uh and so in many other passages if you're familiar with David we know that the bible says that David was a man after God's own heart but this vastly contradicts what is happening in this particular piece uh in this particular passage of scripture as a matter of fact this particular story here in second Samuel chapter 11 is one of the most scandalous literally one of the most scandalous stories that you will probably read about in the bible because again, what was what was happening was one day King David was standing on the rooftop and walking on the rooftop of his palace, and he sees this beautiful woman, uh, which we know to be Bathsheba, and she was taking a bath, and she captivated him so much. I guess she must have really had it going on that he sent for her. And so after he sent for her, one thing led to another and they ended up sleeping together. Now, Bathsheba was a married woman. Uriah was her husband. And so what happened was if this would have been a movie that we see uh, in the theater, it could have easily ended right there. Because a lot of times today's programming and the movies and the things that we see paint us a very untrue and a very sad picture uh, which leads people to believe that there are no consequences for your actions and so we often get to see what looks to be the fun side of sin or the fun side of doing things you know sneaking around and doing all this stuff without really seeing the ugly side of the consequences that come with those particular actions and so again David and Bathsheba might have gotten away they might have gotten away with what they had done or, or, or what happened that day. But one thing happened. Bathsheba got pregnant. Bathsheba ended up getting pregnant from the encounter with uh, David. And so, again, once the news, once David found out that Bathsheba was pregnant, it got worse, y'all. It got so much worse. He ended up having, which Uriah was one of David's soldiers. He was so loyal to David. And what happened was David ended up having Bathsheba's husband killed to try to cover up his mistake, to try to cover up what he had done. And so what happened was David, uh, they were going out to fight. The men were going out to fight. And so David asked the soldiers and the other men in the army to put Uriah, which was Bathsheba's husband, on the front line. And so when they began to open fire, David told them to withdraw from Uriah so that the Uriah would be shot and he would be killed. So I'm, I'm telling y'all, if you've never heard this story, you need to go back and reread like all of it. So you can get a real good handle on what's happening here. So David covers up his one mistake and makes another mistake uh, in regards to, you know, what was going on, trying to cover up all the stuff that was happening. And so, again, you can read uh, the entire text is Second Samuel chapter 11 and chapter 12. And again, you'll find out and you'll see where he had an innocent man killed and all of that stuff. And Uriah was so loyal to David. That's what um, that's what makes it so bad. Right. 
And so here, even after he had Uriah killed, um, he thought his tracks were then covered. He thought he he was out of the, you know, he thought he was good to go. You know, yes, she got pregnant, whatever. He had Uriah, you know, killed, whatever. Um, but God eventually exposed David for what it really was. He, of course, we know, again, other scriptures tell us he was the apple of God's eye. And I'm going to get to that as to why the Bible says that. It doesn't say that for no reason. But he exposed what David did and David had to face serious consequences. Again, remember I said a lot of times the movies we see today are just uh, social media and all of this stuff that we see today does not paint us a true picture of what sin does when we try to hide sin or when we try to cover up one sin with another sin. And David eventually exposed, uh, David was eventually exposed by God and what happened was the baby that Bathsheba got pregnant with ended up dying. And David was extremely broken up about it. I mean, he was extremely hurt about it. So the baby ended up dying again. So if you remember David and if you've ever read about David and any of the stuff that, you know, has happened, uh, any of his stories, you either remember one of two things. You either remember David and Goliath. Most people remember that David where he was, uh, where he fought the giant and, and all of that stuff. Or you remember this particular time when he, uh, that I just recapped, which was his moment of adultery with Bathsheba. And so again, when, when he fights Goliath, it reveals his humility. But when he's here in this situation with Bathsheba, it reveals his humanity. Again, when David fought Goliath, it revealed that he was a man of faith. But when he sinned with Bathsheba, it showed that he was a man also of the flesh. You see how he can be both, how we can be both? Many of us have those particular things. And again, when he fights Goliath, we, are, we witness his greatest victory, one of his greatest victories. But when he meets Bathsheba, we are forced to watch his greatest defeat. And so up until that moment... David had never lost a battle. David had never, you know, had never lost a battle. He was a mighty man of war. And, you know, again, he was, every time he stepped on the battlefield, he was, he was just killing it. You know what I'm saying? He was crushing it. All this stuff, you know, it was all good. But when he stepped into the arena of combat in his own heart, when he stepped into the combat, uh, the arena of combat in his own heart, we are, uh, he gets defeated by a giant that is far greater than Goliath could have ever hoped to have been. And so, again, there are a few things I want to share with you before we before we uh, wrap up tonight. And we're really, you know, we're half about really halfway through. Uh, but at the root of David's problem, what we see is we find a king who was out of place. Now, again, I'm kind of really going real, just kind of really exegeting the text, but he was out of place. We see a king who should have been on the battlefield with his men. He should have been out there on the battlefield, but instead he was at home. Now, many scholars, many theologians say and say or, or, or suggest the reason that David was not out there on the battlefield was that David was experiencing maybe a midlife crisis or David was in a moment of depression. The reason that he was not out there on the battlefield actually leading his men in battle. But whatever the thing was, whatever his reason was for not being uh, out there was one of the first things that that really caused and started the spiral, which was an idle mind, a person who was out of place. He should have been there with his men, but he was instead at home you know, walking around the rooftop of his palace. And so again, it may also be very easy when we're looking at this particular story. And remember, I always say the Bible was written for us, but it was not written to us. So when we look at Bathsheba and her position and the role that she played in this whole thing, it's easy to draw the conclusion that she, um, that, you know, she should share in some of the guilt that David got, uh, you know, that David is experiencing. You know, everybody comes down on David. So some people feel like, okay, well, she was responsible she was an adult whatever but you have to realize that in that day and age that governmental society the king was the absolute authority he was the absolute authority so even if Bathsheba did want to uh, decline or didn't want to say she put herself at risk to even be executed for defying the king's orders or for defying the king's request for her to come so it's not the same as it is today you have to keep in mind that this was a different time period they had 
had a different culture. It was a different way of looking at things. And again, in their governmental society, David was the absolute authority as the king. So whatever the king wanted, the king got. All right. So again, um, seldom, I think when we're looking at it and we're still talking about making miracles from our mistakes, I think seldom when we first start out and when we start out, we don't set out to commit sin. We don't set out to disappoint God. We don't set out to make one mistake and then try to cover it up with another mistake or commit one sin and then try to cover it up with more sins to try to get it right. And I think, you know, by the time that David... By the time that David was told that she was married and all this stuff, he was really at the point of no return. H has anybody ever really been to a point of no return when you felt like, you know, I'm already, you know, why not? You know what I'm saying? You're already kind of out there and it's just kind of like, okay, well, I'll just do this one time and I'll just, you know, whatever. And then, you know, if, if you can be really honest with yourself, I think we've all kind of been at that place one time or another to where we were at the point of no return. But I want to, and again, I'm coming from my book, My Best Year Ever. So if you have this book, um, if you have it, I want to share, uh, I want to share this with you. If you've ever been in a compromising situation, again, that's why I want you guys to have some pen and some paper to write these scriptures down. I want you to read 1 Corinthians 10 and 13. 1 Corinthians 10 and 13 and, and look at what it tells you to do um, and what it suggests for you to do. If you ever find, your pl find yourself in a situation to where you feel like you are at the point of no return. I want you, I'm not even going to go deep into that tonight, but I want you guys to take that time to study. I don't want to feel like I have to tell you, you know, everything. I want you guys to read it and then see what it says that you can do. Or what your out is if you ever find yourself in a situation to where you feel like you are compromising or, or are forced to compromise. or feel like you have no other choice but to compromise. I want to tell you that that is a lie from the enemy. Because God will always make a way of escape. Exactly. Um, you got, I want you guys to study. This is a Bible study, but it's also meant to give you things for you to take back in, in your own time. Because what God may reveal to me, he may, you may read the same scripture and God may reveal something else to you that, um, that applies to your situation in your time of prayer and reading. So I want you guys to go back and look at that scripture for yourself. And so, again, when we look at the giant, when we look at what David's situation was, it wasn't just that, oh, yeah, he was depressed or he was having a midlife crisis. I don't think it ever just starts somewhere. It has to start, you know, with something else. You know, there are always things that lead up to us being in a place. We don't just get... Uh, we just don't become overweight overnight or we just don't become depressed overnight. I think that there are things that lead up to us getting to a certain place. And what what we understand is, again, if we read in Second Samuel uh, chapter five, verses 12 through 13, there we are told that God had blessed David. We are told that God had blessed David and established his kingdom. And um, he had blessed David so much, even when his son Solomon took over the kingdom after David, uh, Solomon even started going down, spiraling down. That's a whole nother Bible study. But even Solomon started spiraling down. But God would not uh, destroy or separate the kingdom because of David. He was keeping his uh, covenant with that he had made with David. He had established David's kingdom. And so we're told that the hand of God was definitely on uh, King David and his reign there in Israel. And so, but we are also giving, uh, we're also seeing here in some distressing news and where it says in verse 13, it says, and David took more concubines and wives out of Jerusalem. Now, why is that a problem? Why is that a problem? We know that we know that um, that they have multiple wives. A lot of the kings and men, they have multiple wives, concubines. And by the way, that was never God's design. That was never God's plan for that particular setup with lots of concubines and wives and all of that stuff. But again, that's another Bible study that but that was never God's design. And so we see that in verse 13, it says that David took more concubines and wives out of Jerusalem. Again, you know, we look at all the great things, but when we talk, when we look at that, we have to go all the way back to Deuteronomy to find out why that was an issue. We go back to Deuteronomy 17. So if you guys are writing this down, we need to write down Deuteronomy 17, 14 through 17. And here, 
we see that God had given instruction and the kings were forbidden to do three things. In Deuteronomy 17, uh, 14 through 17, the king was forbidden to do three things things he was not to accumulate horses he was not to accumulate wives excess excess so we can see when we have some excess in our lives how it can lead us to places that we probably shouldn't be and then the third thing he was not to accumulate gold and silver now uh specifically the scripture in deuteronomy 17 and 17 it says the king must not take many wives for himself because they will turn his heart away from the Lord and he must not accumulate large amounts of wealth in silver and gold for himself. Now this is what it's saying here that the king that if he takes many wives for himself they will turn his heart away from the Lord. Um, that's not in there for no reason. That's not in there for no reason. And that was a lot of Solomon's issue. He had all these foreign wives that they turned his heart away from God. So again David two out of three. David had two out of three. He had two out of three. He honored God's request regarding two of those things, but he disregarded what God said about accumulating wives. I want to know, are, are there some things that you are disregarding in regards to what God is saying not to do in your life? Are we disregarding it thinking that it's not a big deal, that it's going to be okay, or that we are strong enough to overcome or resist the temptation that those particular things will bring with them? I want to know, have you disregarded something? that God said not to do and now you are paying the consequences for disregarding that particular mandate from God I want you to chew on that I want you to think about that because again you know David had uh David had some some things going on his was lust and he was you know lusting after these women and he was idle at times and and just kind of letting the enemy you know play the tricks with his mind but what is your giant what is the giant that you are facing? What is the area that you keep dealing with and, and feel and you feel like you are not able to conquer that particular thing? I want you to really think about that uh, because, again, when we take a look at David's downfall, there were several factors that played a part in the giant attacking his life in that particular thing, that area. Again, it doesn't just start, you know where it is it's, it's little things that come in and creep in when we find ourselves idle um and so again king david should have been on the battlefield with his men he should have been out there fighting with his men instead of being home while they were out fighting instead of being home he should have been out there leading them out and so again idols mind devil's workshop we know that so again, and another thing that we don't often think about is David enjoyed absolute success. David enjoyed absolute success. He had victory over all his enemies of Israel. And, and that's the thing. Success can be a heady thing. Success can be a heady thing. I don't think you are ever as vulnerable to pride creeping in or sin creeping in than you are when you have just experienced a great success. I'm going to say that again. I wish I could say that better. I don't think you are as susceptible to pride coming into your life or to sin creeping in or feeling invincible or feeling like you are above the fray when it comes to resisting sin. I don't think you are as vulnerable to that as you are after you have experienced a great success or you have a mountaintop experience. And why do I say that? Because what happens a lot of times with people that experience a lot of success in their life and they have victory after victory and they are in a season of consecutive wins is they start to feel invincible. They start to feel like things that other people struggle with are not going to be their struggle because, you know, I'm just, it's all good. And so we have to realize that, you know, a lot of times David may have known that maybe he knew that God was with him and he was looking at all this success he had achieved. And maybe he let that particular bit of knowledge go to his head when it came to how he handled things. Because this is the thing when people if when you're going through hard times and when you broke and when you when you don't have two nickels to rub together, it's easy to stay on your knees praying. It's easy to depend on God. Am I right? Can I get an amen? Just I just need one person to be for real. When you are really struggling and when you are really going through something, it's easy to depend on God. Because there's no room for pride when you broke. 
There's no room for pride when you uh your car is getting picked up, you know, from from the parking lot outside of Walmart. There's no room for you to be heady and proud of yourself when you again, when you don't have two nickels to rub together. So a lot of times, but when success comes and you have everything that you want, when you have everything that you need and you don't have to really struggle for anything, it can become easy to become lifted up in pride. Can I get an amen? If just one person, I just need one real person on Periscope or Facebook Live, wherever they are, I just need one person to be for real. But again, when we find ourselves being successful, again, it's it's easy to become lifted up in pride and things that uh and feel like we had something to do with the success or our degree had something to do with it or maybe the family that you grew up in had something to do with it or maybe the you know you grew up on the right side of the track so you know whatever maybe you looking at how you look or or, or whatever I don't know what your thing is but whatever that is a lot of times we can use those things as reasons to feel like we are above the fray when it comes to uh falling into temptation of falling into sin and that is not the case so again here we go with you have to understand that what David went through especially with Bathsheba number one you done killed this innocent man that was so loyal to David y'all if y'all when y'all when I won't say if when you go back and read that entire text and look at how Uriah wouldn't even leave didn't even want to leave David's side and David is forcing this man to go out to battle so he can be knowing he, he was going to be killed so that he could cover up his mistake with his wife, y'all. That's that's scandalous. That's scandalous for real. That is scandalous for real. And so, but there are things that David could have done. And there are things that, and I'm going to apply this to us. There are things that we can do in regards to safeguarding our heart and our mind to, uh, to avoid even in moments of great success I'm not there is nothing wrong with being successful but again you have to know how to safeguard your heart and safeguard your mind uh, because the Giants just like the ones that David faced do not come without they come from within they come from within so we have to make sure that our spirits are fortified to resist that uh, that mindset or whatever that thing is that will cause us to believe that we you know, we don't have to safeguard our heart and mind, which we have to do. So I want to talk about uh, one last thing. And that is uh, there. there's a whenever I go visit one of my sisters, she lives in Tyler. Uh, it's a long drive, of course, about an hour and a half, hour and 45 minutes from where I live to where she lives. And so generally I'll, you know, just put on my put it in cruise control, put on my iPod and we rolling out. But one thing I've noticed is whenever I go and I sometimes I'm driving, if I'm driving at night, there are times when I will become distracted. I may start doing something or my mind may wander and I'll hit or run over. If I start to veer into the other lane, I will hit what I what are called rumble strips. You you we know what rumble strips are, y'all. You when you run over the strips on the side road, like on this uh what am I trying to say? The the median things or whatever, and they make that loud noise so that it gets your attention and so you can snap back into you know and make sure you're paying attention on the road and you have rumble strips, and so those are in place to help uh, distracted drivers and their help to reduce car accidents to get people back, you know, back in their lane. So again, the Holy Spirit even gives us what I call spiritual rumble strips, spiritual rumble strips. And these particular things are come whenever we seem to be in, uh, yeah, the shoulder, Kobe. I was like, what is that called on the road? <laughs> the shoulder of the road. Um, so, yeah, the Holy Spirit gives us spiritual rumble strips. And so if you've ever been in situations uh, or a decision in your life and you felt a tugging in your spirit, you felt a, um, a, a small voice that told you, I wouldn't do that if I were you. That would not end well if it was to get out in the public. If you've ever heard those voices for any particular reason, uh, or even if it's not necessarily a little voice or something that you hear, maybe it's just an uneasy feeling that you have about a particular situation. That could be the Holy Spirit uh, trying to help you to safeguard your heart and mind from doing something that you will regret. 
Have you ever conviction? Absolutely, Nina. Those are things that God would use to convict us, uh, to help steer us. Because again, I say this all the time. God has made too big of an investment in us to allow us to keep going in the wrong direction. And so he will send those moments. He will send those feelings. He will send those nudgings and urgings um, to us in order to keep us from veering too far off the path that God has for our life. And so again, when we look at David's mistake, we can learn how to set up our own set of spiritual rumble strips because a lot of times we wait for God to humble us, but the Bible tells us that we can humble ourselves. We are able to humble ourselves, and you don't want God to humble you. You do not want God to humble you, period, point blank. You think you do, but you do not. So you can humble yourself and start setting these safeguards up for your heart um, to use them as a compass for right living in your life. And so, again, we talked about a lot about David's mistake. We really have. We talked a lot about his mistakes. But the beauty of this particular story is that God still has grace and mercy on us. God still has grace and mercy on us. And so... This is the thing that we have to know. This is the thing that we have to know about God. And I'm not talking about wondering and guessing and unsure and on the fence. This is what we have to know about God. And God would rather forgive us than judge us. I'm going to say that again. God would rather forgive us rather than judge us. And how do I know that? How do I know that? When we look at 2 Samuel 12, I want you guys to write this down. 2 Samuel 12. Verses 1 through 7, you can go through and read all of that for yourself. I'm not going to read it, but what happens is David gets called out by the prophet Nathan. Prophet Nathan comes to him and he's, you know, David, he asks David, he talks about this particular story. Again, I want you guys to read it. I'm not going to tell you everything. If you have never read it, I want you guys to read it. If you have read it, I want you to go back and read it again to see what happens when the prophet Nathan calls out David and David is you know Nathan tries to tell him about this particular story and ask David what you know what would you do or what would you say about something like that and David's response y'all it's just it's a trip but God really calls him out but after that David's knees hit the floor and he comes clean with God and asks for forgiveness and ultimately God did forgive him ultimately God did forgive him and uh, he continued to write an amazing story with David's life. We know that. We Again, we were talking about how even Solomon, even the mess ups that Solomon did, couldn't erase what God had set in place with King David. He continued to write an amazing story. And he can do the same thing with your life. Because God cares more about your next step than he does your misstep. Some of us are so caught up on mistakes that we've made. We're so caught up on how raggedy we've lived or things we've done to other people or mistake again mistakes we've made or whatever but God cares more about your next step moving forward than he does your misstep looking back your past and so but we've got to remember you know I keep taking y'all on a roller coaster right <laughs> I'm gonna do this a roller coaster tonight we got to remember that God will bestow his grace on us but that does not mean that there will not be consequences uh, for the decisions that we make. I'm going to say that again. Let that settle. I'm going to set that right there. God will give us his grace. And sometimes the situations and the things that we do and the outcomes could be a whole lot worse if it were not for God's grace. And so there's, that still does not mean that there will not be consequences that you will have to pay. If I rob a bank, y'all, if I go in and rob Bank of America uh, and I get caught, I'm going to go to jail. I'm going to go to jail. Now, if I sincerely pray and ask God to forgive me and I repent of that, meaning that I'm not steady, you know, setting it off like, you know, like Queen Latifah and Jada Pink and all them, TT them. If I'm not, if, if I'm, if I sincerely repent and change my ways, yes, God will forgive me. But will I still have to serve my time? Probably so. Yeah, probably so. Maybe God's grace will lessen the time, whatever, but there will still be consequences that we have to pay. If if I get if if you know if someone gets pregnant, has a child out of wedlock, um, will God forgive them for that mistake? Yes, the child is not a mistake. It's a consequence of their action. 
but you still have to take care of that child, right? So we still have it does even even God's grace does not wipe out consequences. So we cannot uh, allow the enemy to fool us with that either to feel like, OK, well, if I do it, I'll just ask for forgiveness and then it'll all be good. No, there will be consequences if if you are in a marriage and a covenant relationship with somebody and you step outside of that marriage in some sort of way. Um, can you, can God bring that thing back together? Absolutely. Will it be more difficult for, for that to come together because that trust has been broken? Absolutely. There are consequences. So we cannot use the knowledge of God's forgiveness or God's grace as an excuse to sin and then say, well, I'll just clean it up later. Or God's grace will just clean it up for me later. That's not how it works. There are consequences for our sin. So again, confessing sin to God does not uh, help us escape the consequences, but God does forgive and he forgets our sin. A lot of times if we, if we are still struggling with mistakes that we have made in the past, um, is this Bible study with you every night? No, not every night, almost every night, but, uh, not, we don't do it every night, but, um, I'm going to try to do it more frequently. Uh, I'm going to definitely try to do it more frequently. Uh, because people are, I'm getting a lot of good feedback. But yeah, so we cannot escape the consequences. But if we do find ourselves uh, still struggling with a mistake that we have asked God for forgiveness for, and we've actually changed our ways, I'm not talking about stuff that we still doing. And we just, you know, we feel bad every time we get ready to do it. Not talking about that. I'm talking about things that God has forgiven us of, and we've changed our ways, and we're living a new life, and we've become the new creature that we can be. Uh, if we want to be, if we're still struggling with that, then a lot of times that is condemnation, not conviction. That is condemnation uh, from the enemy that tries to make you feel like what you did is it. That's it. There's no hope after that. Like you did it. There's nothing you can do. Uh, it's a hopeless situation. That is condemnation from the enemy. So you don't, anytime you feel like you're going through something like that or you're feeling that, then you know that is from the enemy. Conviction from God will point out where you are wrong, but it will not leave you there. It will not leave you there. It will show you what right living looks like and help you to get back on the path that God has for you. That's conviction. Condemnation just makes you feel like it's a hopeless situation. Uh, and so we don't want that. We don't even want to listen to that. We don't want to entertain that. That is from the enemy. And so, again, one of the things that I want to leave you guys with is that it is so important it is so important to have the right people around you. It is so important to have people that are going to tell you the truth in your life, y'all. It is so important to not have people that are going to just tell you yes and, you know, not tell you the truth. And not be not hold you accountable to do the things that you say you're going to do. And hearing the, hearing, hearing the truth, y'all, I'm telling you, I know. I have been there and done that. Hearing the truth is not easy, especially when it exposes things about you that are not so great, especially when it exposes things in you that are ugly or, or that, you know, again, that are that are if you if you're steady going around the same mountain. If you're steady struggling with the same cycle, if you're steady going around like the children visual, if you steady find yourself going around that same mountain, you need somebody in your life that is going to put their foot in the middle of your next step and be like, no, you are not taking another step around this same mountain. And this is why you need those kind of people in your life that are not going to allow you to keep going in circles like a hamster on that little wheel, exerting all this energy and getting nowhere. You need somebody that's going to tell you the truth and having that right person in your life that's going to tell you the truth will help you to stay away from the edge of compromise. Just like David was walking on the edge of his palace when he saw Bathsheba, uh, having the right people in your life is going to keep you off of that edge. And that is another way that you can set up those spiritual rumble strips, those spiritual boundaries, those spiritual guardrails in your life to help you guard your heart, guard your mind, keep you from making decisions that you will regret later you just need that person that's going to help you even when you say okay i'm thinking about doing this or i'm thinking about going this way and they question you and ask you are you sure you want to do that have you really thought it through you need those kind of people in your life you don't need the kind of people that are going to see you going off a cliff and wave bye-bye as you keep walking you need those kind of people in your life that are going to tell you the truth and do it in love and do it in love. You need to pray for God. If you feel like you don't have anybody or, you know, you sitting here saying, well, I don't have anybody in my life like that. 
Pray sincerely and ask God to send you people in your life that are going to tell you the truth. And when he sends those people, don't turn them away. Because sometimes we'll ask God for certain things thinking that it's what we want. And then when we get that person to tell us tell us the truth and it doesn't feel good, then we want to send them away and, and say the devil's a lie. So when God sends those people, uh, you know, you have to you you have to accept that as from God. And that's like I said, that's going to be through prayer. And and because when they're from God, uh, because the devil will send people in your life too. he'll send people in your life just like God will send people in your life. But prayer and uh, asking God for discernment is going to make the difference in knowing who's sent from who. So you have to be prayerful about this thing, y'all. And we can't just say prayer like it's a cliche. We literally have to be prayerful. I'm talking about uh, throughout the day, just before you even decide to make any decision, you need to ask God to make sure you have a settling in your spirit, a peace in your spirit about that person. I always ask God to, when it's the right person and the right connection, the right opportunity, I always ask God literally, and you can be specific with God. You should be specific with God. I always say, God, when it's the right person, the right opportunity, the right moment, the right move to make, help my spirit leap just like the baby did in Elizabeth's womb when it's the right person when it's the right opportunity give me a sign to let me know that it's from you yes i'm gonna have peace around it but god i want you to let me know for sure that i am walking in the way that you want for me to go because a lot of times you cannot afford some of us are at a place in our life where we cannot afford to keep making the same mistake some of us are at a place in our life where we cannot afford to keep making the same bad choices we are at a place to where our life literally depends on our next decision. And you cannot, you cannot afford to keep making the same bad decisions, period. Period. Like, it's just no other way to describe it. Like, people literally, there are other people that are attached to you that are suffering because of the decisions that you're making. Many of us have children, we have spouses, we have businesses, we have employees. And if we are at a place to where our decision making is off and we are not consulting God for our next move, other people will be affected by that. I do not want you to feel, sit here and be deceived to feel like nobody else is affected by the decisions that you make. That this is your life, this is my life and I can do what I want. Well, you're, you're right about that. You're absolutely right about that. But again, you still have people that are going to suffer, that are going to suffer because of the decision that you make, period. So again, and I don't believe that God, I think, I don't know, I, I guess because I've met people that think that have that mindset of this is my life and God knows my heart and, um, you know, whatever and, and and you know I gotta go through it for myself and just let me experience it for myself I don't believe that even though I think there are some lessons that we will only learn by having to go through it and I think we all have our journey that God will send us on in order for us to learn some of the things and to develop the character that we will need to sustain us in the next level for whatever that next level and that next dimension that God has for us I definitely think that there are places that we have to go through even valley moments to build our faith build our consistency build our tenacity I believe that but there are some things I do not believe that God intended to for us to have to learn the lesson by having to go through it I think God will place examples just like this example of David in his life I think God will even place examples of people in our own life that will um, help us learn the lessons that we need to learn I would rather I, I listen here I don't know about you but I would rather take sitting and watching somebody else do it than me having to go through it i would rather take heed the warning that god will be sending by having to see okay so this is what happens when we don't safeguard our heart and mind this is what happens when we you know don't don't um don't resist temptation this is what happens when i, I don't really have to go through all of that uh to get the point so I don't, I, again, I don't, I don't, although I know that there are ways that God will, um, you know, like I said, will have us to uh, go through things to develop our character and our spirit man and develop our faith level. I don't believe that there are some things that God um, will not allow us to see someone else, someone else's situation that we can glean from that. Um, so 
in the Psalms, I'm gonna I'm gonna get David out of the hole. I know David's been in a doghouse the whole Bible study, but I don't want to leave him. I don't want to leave him there. So again, we see in Psalms 139, and you guys can write this down too. Psalms 139, uh, 23 through 24. And it says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Point out anything in me that offends you and lead me along the path of everlasting life. This is David talking to God here. And again, David was quick. I'm telling you, David was so quick off the, off the gate when it came to asking God, you know, because to, to search his heart for anything because he knew that he was prone he knew he was prone to other hidden sin and other unhealthy habits. And so we've got to know that, that when we know that we have some things, some habits and some tendencies that God does is not pleased in, we've got to be just like David was here in Psalms 139 and asking God to search out our heart. We cannot try to hide. Have you ever found yourself trying to hide your flaws and hide your bad habits from God? I don't know, maybe just one person. Have you ever really tried to find yourself trying to hide that from God? And so we've got to be for real, y'all. If I, The only way that you will ever be better, the only way that you will ever get over many of the things that have you bound or many of the things that have you on a destructive cycle is to be honest that they even exist in the first place. You have to be honest that you're even struggling with that in the first place. You can't. It's no sense of you trying to be big and bad and trying to act like you got it all together in front of God. Like if you're going to be vulnerable and open up to anybody, many of us will open up to a man or to another person quicker than we will open up to God about what's on our heart and what we're struggling with. Can I get an amen? I have been there. Many of us will open up to people and our best friends, our BFF. Faster than we will open up to God about what is in our heart and, and, and things that are going on with us and our emotions and how we feel. But we've got to switch that, y'all. Again, so you've got to think about what are some of the places, literally places, that cause you to be at your weakest moment spiritually. These are questions that are in the book, y'all. So if y'all don't have the book, My Best Year Ever, um, my inspirational goal setting journal, you can order it off of Amazon.com or you can order it from My Best Year Ever Books.com and that will be an autographed copy that you can order and we will send it to you. Uh, same day we will ship it if you order Monday through Friday before 12 noon Central Standard. Standard time, but y'all, I'm telling you, these questions will help you get your life. <laughs> these questions, and and many people, if you've been following me for a while and you hear me talk and you even talk with me one on one, y'all know I don't sugarcoat anything. Like it's no reason to, and I do not sugarcoat it in this book either. So you have to be for real and answer some of these questions to start. Uh, setting up some rumble strips and creating spiritual boundaries uh, in your life. And again, maybe you maybe maybe you need to stop going to a place that evokes emotional memories, maybe a bad breakup or some point of sin in your life. Maybe you just need to stop going there um, and or maybe um, again, you know, we need to think about the things that we do if we if because some stuff is just clear. Some stuff in the Bible, if we're reading our Bible, if we are praying and intentionally seeking after God, some of this stuff that we act like we struggle with and we're on the fence about and we don't really know what, what God says about this. If you really don't know what God says about it and you are sincere that you don't really know what God says about this particular thing or whether or not you should do it, I would err on the side to not do it. I would err on the side to not do it. If you sincerely are, some of us are just, it, it isn't that we don't know what to do. We just don't want to obey what we know to do. If we just be for real about the whole thing. But if you, if you really don't know and you're saying, well, I don't really know what God says about this and you might not, but I would err on the side of not doing it. If I was that unsure and I would seek out God through prayer and actually in my word in regards to what God says about it. Um, again, and you will not always feel like letting God have control in your life. You will not always feel like uh, working on a relationship or loving other people that don't even like you. You will not feel like that. Like that is unnatural. Our bodies and our minds are. Uh, the tendency of, of our minds is to always seek pleasure or to avoid hard things, to avoid hard tasks. That's not even natural to us. You will not feel like doing those things. But 
again, you know, Jeremiah 17 and 9. This is another scripture I want to leave with y'all. Jeremiah 17 and 9, it says, The human heart is the most deceitful of all things and desperately wicked. Who really knows how bad it is? And that's the New Living Translation of that particular scripture. So you cannot trust your heart. You cannot trust what you feel. Because I'm telling you, your feelings will have you doing one thing one day and doing another thing the next day. You cannot live off of how you feel. You cannot make decisions off of how you feel. One day you feel that your emotions are the most fickle things there is. They change at a moment's notice. You know what I'm saying? You talking about what mood you in today. Okay, well, again... When your situation changed, then there goes your mood. So, I mean, you can't count on that. So, you have to stop waiting to feel like doing the right thing and just do the right thing. People ask me all the time, well, how do I commit? And I don't know how to get more committed. Commitment is a choice, y'all. It's no rocket science. I, it's not five steps to get more committed. Or You make a choice. You make a choice that you are not going to allow what you feel like today to stop you from doing the thing that you say you want to do. When obstacles come in your life, when things come to stop you or slow you down, that obstacles are not to here to necessarily tell you to stop. Obstacles are put in your way to test you, I believe, from God to see if what you say you want to do for him or what you say you want to achieve in life is really what you're willing to do. Many of us want a double anointing. We want the double portion like Elisha but we don't want to do double the work we want to change the world we want to go to the nations and change the world but we won't even change what time we get out of bed in the morning but you want to change the world commitment is a choice that you make and you say to yourself that I am not going to allow anything or anyone to stop me from doing what God has purposed in my heart to do that's the thing. That's why I always stress that we have to uh, give every day a plan. And many of us have five-year plans, uh, six-month plans, one-year plans. But do you have a plan for the next day? Like, what are you going to do with the next 24 hours of your life? Do you know? Or are you just going to get up in the morning, do a routine, and just hope everything falls into place? You've got to make a choice to commit. You've got to tell time what you needed to do because I'm telling you, time is moving whether you're wasting time or whether you're spending your time productively. Time is moving. And we're sitting here talking about, well, it's too late for me. I think it's too late for me in life. Well, the thing about it is, is that, again, time is moving. So next year, you're going to be a year older. And so why not go ahead and start today and, and be a year older and a step ahead than sitting here talking about, oh, it's too late for me to do something in life. Y'all get started on whatever it is that you are supposed to be doing and commit. Make a decision. Don't try to wait on somebody else and try to figure out what this person is going to do and, and what are they going to do. Who who cares what they're going to do? This is about you. You are the one that will stand before God when God asks you to give an account of what did you do with the time that I gave you here on earth. Are you ready to answer that question? What did you do with the time that I gave you here on earth? Because I'm telling you, time is for our benefit. God doesn't operate in time. Time is for us. We operate in time. So time is moving. Time is moving whether you're wasting it or whether you're spending it productively. So why not get a plan? Why not figure out how you're going to, what you're going to tell time to do? You give meaning to time. Or are you just going to continue to, uh, to, to uh, hope everything comes together? Because I'm telling you, if you do not give your, uh, your, your time what if you do not tell your time what you needed to do, I'm telling you somebody else is going to do it for you. And many of us are frustrated day after day because we are living someone else's agenda. Somebody who has their stuff together and has a plan for their day. And they're just telling you what you, what they need you to do to help them move their day forward. But if you want to live in purpose, I'm telling you, y'all, God did not create you to pay bills, go to work, clock in. Ride the clock, be miserable, surf the internet, look on social media, go home, go through a fast food drive through line, click on TV, watch Dancing with the Stars, go to sleep, and, and wake up the next morning and hit repeat. That is not why God created you. That is not why God created you. So you have to um, 
You have to give time instructions on what you needed to do. And I don't even know how I got on that topic because that is not the topic <laughs> that I was talking about tonight. But I think somebody must have needed to hear that uh, because, yeah, I don't know. I was just, I was going off on y'all. Who not doing nothing with their time? Why did I go off on y'all like that? <laughs> anyway, y'all. Yeah, but um, so I want you guys to realize that you can make miracles with your mistakes. And again, I, if you guys want to get more into this Bible study to this particular lesson, uh, you can order my book, My Best Year Ever, 12 Lessons to Help You Make This a um, uh year to remember you can order it on amazon.com or you can order it from my best year ever book.com uh and you would that is a um a you will get an autographed copy um of that if you order it from my website my best year ever if it's amazon then it's not autographed but um so yeah y'all and i am i have a couple things because we're ending up we're wrapping up uh another month like literally september is gonna happen this week like the beginning of september and so of course if you have the emerge online devotional app the emerge online devotional app uh then you guys will be getting all the new stuff we have a new bible reading plan in the app uh that is in there that i created it's the bold faith bible reading plan so if you do not have the app or if you have no idea what i'm talking about I have a Bible app that we send out daily devotionals, uh, inspirational messages, videos, all of my YouTube replay. I mean, all of my replays and stuff like that for these videos and Bible studies are there within the app. So you can actually download it. It is a free app uh, in the App Store or the Google Play Store. Um, and, you know, yeah, so it is what it is. But, yeah, I'm actually going to start uh, an accountability group this week for women uh brothers i'm not trying to leave y'all out or nothing like that but this group will specifically be for women because we are getting ready to approach the fourth quarter um we're getting ready to approach the fourth quarter of the year when uh september is up that's october november december that's the fourth quarter and if you are still trying to plan and make something happen for 2016 you are behind like I have already, the app is uh the app is called the Emerge. I almost forgot my app name. Emerge Online Devotional App. Emerge Online Devotional App. And generally, if you put all of those in there in the app store, or whatever, then it'll come right up. The little icon is a purple uh, icon with the word me. Uh, the word me in it. Uh, it says me. So yeah, that is that is what it is. I would love for you guys to have it and download it, and you can order the book and as well as the my to achieve journal which uh, I got a call from the gentleman that is printing our journals and the journals will be coming headed this way this week so if you ordered if you pre-ordered one of the journals as well then you should probably have it in your hands next week hopefully uh, so yeah we'll see you will see but you know you can never you can never be too sure but he did tell me they would be on their way this week to me so I can get them to you guys ASAP so anyway yeah I was saying that I'm starting an accountability group and God gave me the title to finish strong ladies and well gentlemen y'all too y'all can finish strong too no problem with I have no problem with that but um this is the year that we will finish this year strong and so I'm going to I'm still fleshing it out and hashing it all out and uh seeing how we're gonna do it I don't know if we're gonna do a Facebook group or just whatever which we'll probably do a Facebook group but we're going to do that y'all because it is time y'all if if you feel yourself if you be honest with yourself, if you feel yourself approaching the end of this year and you still have not hit any of your goals, then it's time to, for you. To, you need to be in this accountability group for real. You need to be one of the people that's in this accountability group and it will be a free accountability group. Y'all uh, this year has been uh, an explosive one for me as far as what I. I can see as far as what God has done, we launched uh, many of the things that were on my vision board with writing my writing and releasing my very first book, uh, releasing the app, uh, getting ready to release our second book by the end of at the beginning of next year. We're writing uh, we're in the we're writing it now, having the book cover, having all that stuff designed, getting the forward written by someone very special. Um, and so we're doing all of these things. And, and, and even with my businesses, launching my property management company. I'm not saying that to brag. I'm saying that to say that there is a way that you can get things done. 
get it done. And so I want you guys to be a part of this accountability group. Um, and and um, and we are going to crush it, y'all. There's 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 power in consistency, and there's power in clarity around your goals. There's power in uh, being consistent. That that's really that's really the thing. And there's power in visualizing what you want God to do in your life. Uh, there's power in planning. There's power in controlling your time each and every day. And that's what I want to share and impart into you guys for this day. Um, for this for this next challenge. It will start in September. It will start at the beginning of September. So it will be this week. And um, so you know we'll we'll do that. And um. Yeah, guys, um, we're going to do it and we're going to finish this year strong. So I'll be sharing more details about how that's going to work and all of that stuff later this week. But I wanted to put that on you guys minds. So again, uh, to wrap it up, I want you guys to if you have not ordered a copy of my best year ever, uh, you can do that by visiting my website or you can order it from Amazon.com as well as you if you have not downloaded the app. Number two, Emily, um, if you have not downloaded the app, then you can uh, do that. And it is not under my name. So don't go in there. Don't go in the app store typing in Rachel L. Proctor because you will, nothing will come up. Um, you have to type in Emerge Online Devotional uh, app and it will come up. And it is a free app and um, it's got a lot of great things in it. Like I said, we we are launching our new Bible reading plan and all of that stuff for September. And we will have our new theme for September and I'm not telling y'all what it is just yet you'll have to get the app in order to find out what it is all right when will I go live again Tabitha I don't know I don't know probably I mean you know I, I really I'm on Periscope just about every day I'm just not on Facebook live every day like that um so I'm on Periscope just about every day so if you have Periscope then you know you can follow me there and I'm I'm usually live um over there every day but um as far as bible studies and facebook live i don't know i ha I probably should set a schedule but my schedule is so crazy um usually in the evenings to you know i don't really have a day that i'm like okay i have this day that i can do it every single week so i don't want to i i I've try not to commit uh if i know that you know like i said my schedule is crazy so i try to hop on and notify you guys again i notify you if you're on my email list or if you have the app, or if you're on my Instagram page, um, then I generally not notify, try to notify you guys several hours ahead of time whenever I'm going live that night. So, yeah. All right, guys. Well, we have wrapped it up. I hope I closed that out. I don't even remember. I think, did I leave David? Did I get David out the doghouse? <laughs> I don't know. Did I get David out of the doghouse? Um, so, yes. Hey, Soror. Yeah, so, yeah, but you guys have to set up those boundaries. You have to set up those boundaries. Um, so, yeah, if you guys have a prayer request, you can drop it in the chat section. Or if you have the Emerge Online devotional app, you can submit us a prayer request through the app. Um, I try to respond to those. Um, I try to respond to those as soon as I can. As you can imagine, we get a lot of prayer requests, so I'm not able to always respond immediately, but please know that we are praying for you guys. Everything that comes in, we pray over those daily. So, yes, dear God, we thank you so much for tonight. We thank you for this word that you have come to feed us, God. God, we thank you for each and every person that is represented here. God, you know each and every situation that they are facing. God, I'm praying and asking you to give them strength and courage to be consistent around anything that they are struggling with inconsistency with, God. Um, God, I thank you so much for uh, giving them the uh, vision and the, the desire to want to know you more and know you on a different level, God. God, I thank you because I see you increasing their faith. I, I see you increasing uh, their their prosperity and not so much as financially, God, but prospering in happiness, prospering in joy, prospering in peace in their life, God. Some people just don't want more money. They just want a good night's rest, God. They just want peace in their life God and I see you doing that for whoever that person is and God I thank you so much for health in our bodies I thank you so much for um 
for for our health in our bodies and for our minds and for our spirits, God. I thank you for uh, speaking to that person that has decided that they were going to give up, God. But I thank you because I feel you speaking a word to that person and giving them the courage to get back up from whatever that situation is and to continue to move forward, God. God, I thank you so much for right decision-making ability, God. I thank you for uh, right living, the desire to have right living, God. I thank you so much to for us to get the desire Desire to have the right relationships, God, and giving us the courage to cut off relationships that are causing us to compromise, God. God, I thank you so much for doing it. I thank you so much for all that you're going to do and all that you have done. And God, even if you don't do anything else, we know that you are still God and that you have done enough. And we thank you so much. We worship you. We praise you. And we believe all these things done through faith in Jesus name. Amen. All right, guys. Well, I'm getting ready to go to sleep because that's what you should do this time of night. It's 11 o'clock. So, yeah. All right. Um, well, thank you guys for joining in. Thank you guys who have hung out the entire time. Y'all are so sweet. Can can you do you write your book in three months scopes again? Oh, yeah. The the um the book writing scope. Yeah, I'll do one. I'll do one for sure. I'll do one uh very soon. As a matter of fact, Jay, thank you for reminding me. Jay, they over here on Periscope Facebook, they're asking if I can do another another scope or broadcast about how to write your book in three months. Yes, you can do it. Yes, you can. So they want me to do another one. So yeah. All right, I'll do that. I'll make plans to do that very, very, very soon. All right, again, guys, um, I am going to holler at y'all tomorrow.